Okay, hello and welcome to another tutorial video. As you can see, we're gonna be going over the balance sheet in this one. Now, this is a bit of a back to the future type topic because we haven't really covered these basic accounting concepts in a long time in this channel, but I do think it's worth revisiting them over time. There have also been some accounting changes over the years, which makes something like the balance sheet actually a little bit more complicated and worth revisiting and reviewing periodically. So if you want the tutorial in writing, the screenshots, the PDFs, and the Excel model, you can go to this URL. It's a long URL. I will link to it below the video and pin it as the first comment so you can get everything right there. As always, I'm gonna give you the three minute answer here. And then if you want more detail, you can keep watching and we'll go into some of the formulas and other nuances here in more detail. So the balance sheet gives you a snapshot of a company's resources, its assets, and its funding sources for those resources. So it's liabilities and equity at a single point in time. The most fundamental equation is that the assets on the balance sheet must equal the company's liabilities plus equity. So it's saying that a company cannot get resources unless it has some funding source for those resources. Now you can use the balance sheet for a lot of different things. You can use it to figure out a company's liquidity, how much in financing it needs to fund a new factory or make an acquisition or something like that. You can look at it and figure out a company's business policies, such as how long it takes to collect cash or pay suppliers, for example, or even its overall risk. For example, maybe the company has too much debt right now, and especially compared to where it's been historically, that high debt level presents some risk to the overall business. Now, I don't think there is a strict definition of assets, liabilities, and equity, or at least not a precise definition, but generally speaking, assets can be sold for cash or they provide some type of future benefit to the company. And I'm gonna bring up the Excel model here and go to the balance sheet for this company, Monster Beverage, which of course makes the Monster Energy drinks. On their balance sheet, you see things like cash and accounts receivable and inventory and plants, property, and equipment, goodwill and tangible assets. So all these provide some type of benefit or in the case of the investments, it can be sold for or exchanged for cash. Liabilities represent future obligations or future cash outflows, such as debt that needs to be repaid in the future. So again, if we go back to the Excel file here, items like accounts payable and accrued liabilities represent payments that the company owes to suppliers and other parties. Then there are items like debt, which I just mentioned that have to be repaid in the future. Other long-term liabilities typically represent some type of owed payment as well. And even something like deferred revenue may seem positive, but if you think about it, it means that now when the company finally delivers the product or service, it has to pay something to do that. So in a way, it's another type of obligation. And then finally, the equity section is for additional funding sources. The difference between equity and liabilities is that equity items could be generated internally or raised externally. They are still obligations, but they aren't necessarily direct cash outflows in the same way liabilities are. So that makes them sort of similar, but also different in a way, which is why they're shown in a separate section. Now, usually assets and liabilities are split into short-term and long-term versions. If we go to Monster's version of its balance sheet right here, you can see they have current assets and then they list their long-term assets and then they have their current liabilities and then they list their long-term liabilities and then their equity section below that. So that's the normal split on the financial statements. The current items are typically linked to the income statement. So accounts receivable and deferred revenue, for example, are usually percentages of revenue. Long-term items and equity tend to flow in from the cash flow statement. And the rule here is that if you are on the asset side of the balance sheet, so let's go up and take a look at something like net PPE. The rule here is that you link to the old item and then you subtract the corresponding items on the cash flow statement. So depreciation in this case, and then capital expenditures. Now these already have the correct signs. So if the company's CapEx is ahead of its DNA, this net PPE number will keep going up over time. On the other hand, when you're on the liability side, you do the opposite. So for something like debt, you take the old number and then you add the corresponding line items on the cash flow statement to link this in. Equity is also similar in that you add the items here. It's just that there are a whole lot more line items to add and we'll go over some of these later in this tutorial. Cash and equity here act as the balancers because if you think about it, everything on the income statement affects net income. So if you go up and take a look at this, net income is the very bottom line on the company's income statement. So everything affects that. And then on the balance sheet with equity, net income flows directly into equity. So effectively, this is reflecting everything that has already happened on the income statement. And then the, on the other side, the cash number here comes directly from the bottom of the cash flow statement. So effectively, the role 
of the balance sheet here is to reflect everything that has happened on the other financial statements. And if you do that properly and you reflect all the changes, then the balance sheet should stay in balance. In interviews, the main significance of the balance sheet is that when you get an accounting question, such as what happens when depreciation goes up by 10 or when accounts receivable goes up or down by 10, you want to go through the income statement and cash flow statement and then always end your answer by explaining how the balance sheet remains in balance. And that's a good way to check your work and make sure you're doing the walkthrough properly. So that's it for the short version here. We'll now go through each of these topics in a bit more detail. So we're gonna start with a balance sheet sample and some example line items in each section. Then we'll go to the financial model projections and required links. And then we'll talk about why the balance sheet is critical in interview questions. And I'll go through a sample interview question and illustrate why you always want to end by explaining how the balance sheet balances. So Monster Energy here is our example because their balance sheet is fairly clean and simple. And in general, consumer retail companies are quite good for understanding these concepts and getting some modeling practice. So that's why I've picked it here. Now the short-term items on the company's balance sheet are pretty much all relating to day-to-day -day business activities. So if we go up, accounts receivable relates to how they sell and deliver products, but then they may need to wait a while to get cash payment from customers. Inventory is what they need to actually produce their energy drinks and sell them. Prepaid expenses represents items that they've paid for in advance, but haven't yet recognized as expenses. And then on the liability side, accounts payable and accrued liabilities both represent owed payments to suppliers that will be paid in the future. So these are all pretty much day-to-day -day items. If you go to the long-term items, on the asset side, most of these are related to investment and growth. So for example, net pp &E relates to any factories or equipment that they have. Other long-term assets might relate to things like lease assets, if they are leasing some of their properties rather than owning them directly. Goodwill and intangibles relate to acquisitions and how these are going to drive the company's long-term value as well. Now, as a convention, we typically combine the short-term and long-term versions of the same item. We also typically simplify equity down to one single line item. So if you look at the company's balance sheet in their filings, they have four or five different items here within the shareholders equity section, but we've simplified this whole thing and we just have the single line item for equity down here. And that just really makes the modeling process a little bit simpler and faster. Also, if you go and look at the company's balance sheet, they have short-term deferred revenue and then long-term deferred revenue. But we don't really think it's necessary to do that. So we have actually simplified it here as we almost always do. And we've just combined everything into the long-term deferred revenue line item just to make it a little bit easier to project and link these items. Now on that note, with the projections for the balance sheet in financial models, generally speaking, current assets and current liabilities are linked to the income statement line items. This is not true for cash and debt if they appear in this section, but everything that's operational, receivables, inventory, payables, prepaid expenses, almost all of these are linked to income statement line items. So for example, for something like prepaid expenses, you might link it to cost of goods sold or operating expenses, and the same thing for accounts payable. Let's look at a quick example here. So if we look at the prepaid expenses and other assets and what it is being linked to, we link to the operating expenses on the income statement, and then we multiply this by a percentage up here, prepaid expenses and other assets as a percent of operating expenses. Now, one question we get a lot is, what if you don't know what to link these items to? So for example here, why are we linking prepaid expenses to operating expenses? Why don't we link it to cost of sales or cost of goods sold instead? And the answer, as I say in this bullet point, is that you could do that if you want, and it's usually fine, what you really have to watch for is the change in working capital and also the overall levels of working capital because you want these to be reasonable over time. So let's go down to the cash flow statement and take a look at what I mean. If we look at the change in working capital historically here, let's just add up all the items in this section. So these are changes in the operational short-term balance sheet line items. We can see that typically it has been negative historically and so going forward, we would expect it to be negative as well. And we want this to be in about the same size as a percent of revenue or the change in revenue. We haven't calculated that part, but it seems to be negative going forward in about the same range. And so that's the type of outcome you want. But the exact links here don't really make a huge difference in most cases, as long as the overall output is consistent. With long-term assets, typically you take the old item and then you subtract the corresponding cash flow statement line item. So let's go up and take a look at this. PPE is one example I just showed you before where we take the old item, subtract depreciation and CapEx, but 
Goodwill and intangibles is another example. We take the old item and then we subtract amortization of intangibles, goodwill and intangible impairments, and then also additions to intangibles. So purchases that add to this balance. So that is always how you do it. You always subtract these links on the asset side. One possible exception is with lease assets, as I say here. Unfortunately, we don't have it on Monster's balance sheet because they're so small, but typically for lease assets, you'll make these a percent of the operating expenses or something else on the income statement. Long-term liabilities, you normally take the old item and then you add the corresponding change on the cash flow statement. Debt is probably the best example of this. There are some exceptions though. Items like deferred revenue and other long-term liabilities if they're operational in nature, can also be linked to income statement line items. And I have some notes about those exceptions and some examples here. And then for equity, this is a pretty long formula, but essentially the way this works is that you always wanna start with the old number, add net income, and then add any miscellaneous items like stock-based compensation that relate to equity in some way, add the dividends paid, stock issuances and repurchases. These should have positive or negative signs on the cash flow statement already. So effectively what you're doing here is factoring in the net income. And then if the company issues dividends or repurchases stock, you effectively subtract those from equity. So there are a lot more items going into this, but the basic idea here is not too complicated. You want to reflect the after-tax profits and how that grows the equity. If they issue stock, that also grows the equity. But if they repurchase stock or they distribute some of those profits to the shareholders, that reduces the equity. So now to the final point here, interview questions. When you get an accounting interview question about walking through the three financial statements after a specific change, you always want to go through the income statement and cash flow statement first and then finish with the balance sheet. So for example, if they ask you what happens when depreciation goes up by 20, you would start by saying that on the income statement, pre-tax income goes down by 20. And if you assume a 25% tax rate, net income will go down by 15. On the cash flow statement, Net income is down by 15, but the depreciation was non-cash. So you add back that 20. And so cash is up by 20 because you have one change where it was down by 15, another one where it was up by 20. And then you end with the balance sheet. On the asset side, cash is up by five. pp e is down by 20 because of the depreciation. So the total assets are down by 15. Now on the other side, remember that net income was down by 15. And so net income flows into equity as I just showed you which means that equity is down by 15. So the liabilities and equity side is down by 15. The asset side is also down by 15 and the balance sheet balances. Now, this is a very simple question, but even for more complex questions, you can use the same strategy. You're not guaranteed to get it right if your balance sheet balances at the end, but if it does balance, there's a pretty good chance that you are correct or at least close to correct. And if it doesn't balance, you've definitely done something wrong. So we always recommend going in this order. And this is how the balance sheet comes up and is important in interviews. So that's about it. We started by going through a balance sheet sample and going through some example lot items for Monster Beverage right here. Then we went through the financial models and required links. The bottom line is that current assets and current liabilities tend to be linked to the income statement lot items. Longer term assets and liabilities tend to flow in from various items on the cash flow statement although there are some exceptions such as with lease assets, lease liabilities, and even something like long-term deferred revenue could be more operational in nature. Cash on the balance sheet should reflect everything that has happened on the cash flow statement. And then the equity line reflects some of the cash flow statement as well, but it also reflects everything that's happened on the income statement because of the fact that net income flows directly into equity. And the balance sheet is critical in interview questions because it's a good way to check yourself. If you walk through everything, the income statement, cash flow statement, and you finish with the balance sheet and everything balances, you are probably correct, though it's not guaranteed. And if the balance sheet doesn't balance, you've done something wrong and you need to rethink how you're answering the question. So that's it for this lesson. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about the balance sheet, or if you already knew about this topic, you have a review of the main concepts and some good references to look at.